that I was not going to do this live on my phone anymore, but apparently my phone only allows me to record up to 40 minutes and 33 seconds of video, so here I am doing this live. That being said, welcome to Mystery Mondays. Thank you for viewing, subscribing, and sharing. And I'm sure it's probably not doing this publicly anyway because it never does. It always makes me go back and change it from private to public once I've finished recording, even though it says it's doing it publicly. So, anyway, today I am once again stepping away from the cold cases of missing persons in national parks in the United States to focus on some more recent cases that involve my home state of Arkansas, the state I was born in and lived in most of my life. On Monday, the 25th of April, I plan to return to those cold cases by discussing the murder of Armand B. Johnson, which occurred on April 13th, 2005, in Hawaii Volcanoes um, National Park. So make sure you tune in for that episode. I did not realize that the anniversary of his murder was last week, or I would have tried to cover it on the anniversary or around the anniversary. Um, the cases I'm talking about tonight are those of Jason J. Lirel um, and Jason Dubois. I learned of both of these cases via Facebook. Thank you for joining me. One, because I was told one of my friends commented on the page, and the other, because a person who was close to him messaged and told me they suspect foul play in the death. Thank you, thank you for leaving. <laughs> I can't even see if people comment on this with it on my phone, but anyway. Um, I previously covered the basics of Jason Lirel's case as to avoid some drama surrounding his case and not bringing up his personal life, and am discussing his case first and still not bringing the majority of that stuff up. I was on the Facebook page about him being missing today, which was Saturday the 16th, was when I was making these notes, and there is a person who may have been the last person to see Jay before he went missing, who was arrested on unrelated charges. I repeat, this person was arrested on unrelated charges, but he is thought to be the last person who saw Jason on January 25th, 2022. Hopefully, while this person, um, this person is no longer in police custody, so obviously he has nothing to do with Jason's disappearance. I'm satisfied that the police thoroughly questioned him while he was in there. But hopefully, while he was in police custody, he told his story about what happened and where Jason was the last that he knew. Previously, this man stated to a friend that Jason had walked away from the man's home by himself. I keep thinking that's an interesting way to word that. Jay had been friends with Don for years. I keep saying that the wrong way. Don had been friends. Mm, Jay had been friends with Don. Don and Jay had been friends years before um, this, but they, but he had not, they had not seen each other in many years until the weekend before Jay was last seen. In fact, Don didn't recognize Jay and made a comment about him looking like his old friend Jason Lirel, or maybe he called him Jay. Anyway, Jay was going through some tough times and wanted to get his mind off his troubles. He spent four through five days on a large plot of land owned by a friend and left a few times with Don and or other people who were staying at the home on um, who were staying at the home on this land or visiting. And the reason that I say he was there for four or five days is because um, the woman who owns the land never saw him on the fifth day. So she is not sure whether he was there at all that day or not. And the person who drove her to go get groceries did not see him there that day either. Um, 
The homeowner left early the day that he went missing. Um, she left with a woman who stayed at her home. And they left to go shopping and visit another friend who lived in southwest Missouri. I'm trying to get my directions straight here. Dawn was at her home when she left, along with a man named Troy, and she thought Jason was still there, but she did not see him at all that day. After she returned home, which was around 9 p.m. that day, she texted Dawn, you know, Jay, Jay wasn't there, so she texted Dawn and asked if he knew where Jason was, and that's when he replied that Jay walked away from his home by himself. And I'm thinking maybe she is the one that actually words it, that he walked away by himself. Um, because these are from posts that um, she made that said that, like a timeline she posted. Apparently, she has no vehicle of her own. Other people had to drive her to get groceries and do things she needed to do. Therefore, she couldn't drive to Dawn's and look along the way for Jason. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, she was like, well, I guess maybe he went to go get his motorcycle from the store or something. I did discuss this case the last um, Mystery Mondays that I did. I think it was two weeks ago, I believe, um, which would have been April 4th. So, um, it also seems that Dawn did not say what time this happened, and I have another statement um, concerning his conversations about Jay leaving his home here in a little bit. Um, the lady's property has now been searched twice. She told authorities to, feel, to dig any place that they felt they needed to dig. She lives in the beautiful area of Hogsgald near Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And um, I found out that Dawn was arrested in a nearby county and was on hold for Madison County. Though the way that the site shows that, is, it's really confusing because I'm like, okay, was he actually on hold for Madison County and arrested by the other county because he was being held in the other county? So I think perhaps he was arrested in Madison County and on hold for the other county, um, which is the county where Jason lived. Um, so I, I don't know that his that him being arrested had anything at all to do with Jay's case. I'm not telling the last names of these people, most and not the names of most of them. Mostly because they are supposed to be innocent until they may be proven guilty. Don has said he went to take a shower and when he got done, Jason was gone. He's like, he's like I went to take a shower and I came back, Jason was gone, like poof, he was gone. It it seems to me that he assumed Jason walked from his home because he had no vehicle there, but he may have contacted someone to pick him up, though he had been walking a lot um, in the time that he was, there was another time that he walked from down the road from the lady's house to the lady's house. He walked for an entire day around her property and did some hunting and stuff. Um, so he's used to walking quite a bit, and as I said, I'm pretty sure he's a Marine. Um, but yeah, he may have he may have contacted someone, nonetheless, to pick him up, or someone that he knew may have come along and been like, "Hey, you need a ride," and might have given him a ride. Um, local police do have his phone records, and I'm sure they know if he texted or called someone to pick him up or not, or texted or called someone around the time that Dawn was in the shower if that makes sense. Jay did text his sister that afternoon between 4.30 and 5 p.m. saying he would be home that evening. I think it was only the one text from what she shared on his missing page, but his phone did ping on the 27th of January, which was two days after he was last seen, and it pinged near Clifty, Arkansas. 
if his location, the GPS location, was on, this would have been fairly accurate and not have required activity on his part, from what I understand, from what people that know more about this stuff than me have told me. Um, when people texted him or tried calling him, it would likely update his location. It would also do this when apps on his phone were active, like if they were sending him a notification or updating or something like that. Um, there was something else I was going to say, but it slipped my mind. Um, so, I do, speaking of apps, I highly recommend that everyone download, use, and add friends and loved ones to the app Life360. It's an excellent way to know where your loved ones are, to know their locations. Um, you know, if they go on a trip somewhere and they don't think to let you know when they get there, you go, well, are they there? And you check and you're like, oh, yes, they are there. Um, if they're going on a date with someone that you don't trust and it's like they're supposed to be going to Stillwater to a casino and you check and they're in Salisaw at a river or something, it's like, hmm, what's up with that, you know? Um, but if his GPS location was off to save the, ba the battery life, say, which a lot of people turn it off to save their battery life, he would have had to be doing something on his phone for it to ping, like texting or taking a call or doing something on an app himself, um, from what I understand. Or someone would have had to be doing something on it. Jay is about 5 foot 6 inches to 5 foot 7 inches tall. He weighs around 160 to 170 pounds. He has light brown to medium brown hair and blue eyes, though some of the things do say green, and I think it's possible his eyes are hazel and change from blue to green, maybe even gray from time to time. He is a white male who is 42 years old and is dearly missed by his family and friends. He has two tattoos on his right arm, one on his forearm, um, the inside of his forearm, that says cross with the date 111 12 below it and um, that one is like in this my arm looks weird there but anyway it's in this general area of the arm right here and the other one is on his bicep and is a black cross um, that is five or six inches big I almost said large it's five or six inches big and it is basically four triangles turned in toward each other to form a cross. Um, there's a name for those types of crosses, but I do not know what they are called. I tried to look it up multiple times and did not find any information on that. Um, his cell phone is somewhere, but to my knowledge, it has not yet been found. A property near where it last was searched by volunteers and I'm sure the sheriff's office also searched that general area. They, they found nothing they considered to be of importance to his disappearance whenever they searched that area. Hopefully his friends and family soon get the answers they need and Jay is found safe. Um, I told a couple of stories here a while ago. I guess I'll go ahead and tell at least one of them. I was reading a story today about a man who was found near in a community outside of Salt Lake City, Utah, who had gone missing from a town just north of, well, several miles north, actually, of Sacramento, California. He was like 700 miles away from where he went missing. He was an autistic 16-year-old boy, went missing... Um, when he went missing, he was 16 years old, and he was found three years later, recently, I'm not sure what the exact date was, but stories like that give hope that someone who is missing is possibly still alive. Um, and this young man had had a couple of run-ins run with the police before, or like people had called the police about him before, but they had no reason to arrest him or to pick him up. And someone called them and told them that 
Um, there was a man who was sleeping in the street, shivering near a gas station. So they went to check on the person. And after they talked to him for a while, they discovered that he was this 16-year-old missing autistic boy from California. So that's a really inspiring story that gives hope that someone um, could be alive. And I always hold out hope. Like the Morgan Nick story, I always hold out hope that the people could possibly be alive um, if they, until they are found to not be alive. I always hope that they are alive, and I'm not going to think of her name. The girl that was missing for years and years and years who um, outsmarted the man who had captured her years before, who was having her live as one of his wives or something along, I'm pretty sure that's what it was. And um, she outsmarted him and convinced him to let her go somewhere by herself. And then she told someone that she was who she was, you know. Um, so that's another story. And there's one about the boy that lived in, um, well, I don't know that he lived there. There was a boy that got abducted when he was like seven or eight years old. And he was living in St. Louis with a man he believed to be his uncle. And the man told him that his father had died in a car accident. He was like seven or eight when he went there, as I said. The man told him that his father had died in a car accident. And he was his uncle. Maybe he told him both his parents had died. Um, but he told him he was his uncle. And he trusted and believed the man. The man never harmed this kid. Another kid came to stay with them. And, you know, the kid, of course, asked about it. And at that time, the kid was 15 years old. And, um... The man was like, he's a friend of mine's kid. He's going to be staying with us for a while or something along that line. And the kid had asked the man if he could go to the store to get some stuff. And the guy was like, yeah, get, get some milk, you know. And so he jumped on his bike and starts going to the store. And he sees a poster of the little boy that's at the house. And it says, you know, missing kid. Have you seen this kid or whatever? So he grabs the poster, goes ahead and goes to the store to get the milk. And he says, you know, by the way, this kid's at my house, or, or however he says it, I don't know for sure, but, so they ask him, they're like, are you sure it's this kid, and he's like, yeah, um, he's staying with me and my uncle, my uncle said he's a friend of his, his kid, not sure why they think he's missing, is probably what he said, you know, and so they went to the house, arrested the man, got the kid, and um, I, it didn't, it wasn't that, all that quick, I'm sure, but they went, they did go to the house, they arrested the man, they got the little boy who had recently been kidnapped, they asked the other boy what his name was, I'm pretty sure his name was Ryan, and, um, you know, he had the last name, and the same last name as his uncle was what he had told him his last name was, and I think they took some pictures of him, um, but anyway, they ended up finding out that he was this boy that had been abducted like seven or eight years before um, the other boy was abducted, and the the man, I'm pretty sure, was just someone that wanted to have kids and could not have kids, so he was taking kids, um, kids that were of an age that could take care of themselves if he was having trouble taking care of them, basically, and my thought is, you know, he's like, this boy is 15, he's going to be out of my house in three years, and I'll be all by myself again, so he wanted another kid there. But those are stories um, that give hope that people who are missing could still be out there alive somewhere. And that being said, there were at least two sightings of a man who resembled Jay in Tulsa, Oklahoma within the same week. That was around April the 4th through April the 11th or so. One of his best friends said the photo of the first man, the first photos, um, the person that saw the man, was not him and the other person didn't take any photos because he was unaware of Jason's disappearance at that time. The guy's wife found out about the fact that he was missing. She joined the page and when he came home she was like, you haven't seen this guy anywhere have you? And he was like, yeah I just saw that guy a while ago. And she's like, well he's missing. His family is, you know. And he's like, well I didn't know. You know, and so I think they drove around the area where he saw him but didn't see the guy. And, um, so those both happened in the same week, um, that I know of no one else has seen him, and as I said, one of Jason's best friends said that it was not him, it was a picture of, they were pictures of the guy from the side, um, profile pictures, 
believe one from one side and the other from the other side and I'm like I mean I could make that look like three or four different people but I know um so they weren't the greatest of pictures but I, they were taken with a cell phone I'm sure and they weren't the worst of pictures either but so um if you have any information um yes if you have any information about Jason Lyrell, um, Jay Lyrell, where he may be, or what may have happened to him, please call the Madison County, Arkansas Sheriff's Office at 479-738-2320 or call the tip line for WHTM, We Help the Missing, at 866 866- six six zero four zero two five and when i am able to i will put those in the description of my video it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't give me the option to do that when i do these live videos for some reason it's like yeah the hashtag or two might draw in a viewer or two <laughs> goodness forbid but anyway um Again, I'm going to give you guys those numbers because I don't know if I gave the second one or not. I can't remember. But the one for the Madison County Sheriff's Office in Arkansas is 479-738-2320. The tip line for We Help the Missing, WHTM, is 866-660-4025. As always, if you find something you think may belong to Jay, leave the item or items in place and notify the sheriff's office or your local police. You can take pictures of them um, so you can send those to the police and mark down the coordinates, like write them down somewhere or type them into your phone or something to give them an idea um, so they know like exactly where to look for the items or of course you can stay with them but who knows how long it may take them to get someone out there um, or you can notify your the local police if it's not in the Madison County area. When he went missing he had been living in Fayetteville, Arkansas so it is possible he is anywhere from Eureka Springs, Arkansas, or Huntsville, Arkansas, to Fayetteville, Arkansas, or even Eagle Rock, Missouri, or that general area, because a friend of a friend's lives there, or he could be anywhere in between these places. I should have taken my dogs out whenever I realized that my camera stopped recording a while ago. So... I was planning to cover all of Jason Dubois' story also tonight, but I won't be doing that because I am. Anyway, no. Uh, sorry about that. Um, apparently I had live chat off. Anyway, I won't be able to do that because I don't want my videos to be too long, and they always end up being that way anyway because I'm a chatty Cathy. And that being said, um, when I got into doing this, I'd like to only cover one case per vlog, per vlog for this. Um, but they are all so important that I also want to do like a hundred in the same vlog, but I can't get as much information out that way. Um, I thought for a while I would start doing these like maybe two or three times a week, but doing the research for them and everything, I do good to get them done, um, to get one done a week. But I am going to start doing at least one a week um, for the most part. And if I'm not going to do one, I will try to do a brief video to let you guys know that I won't be doing one. And I'm going to go back to the work world. I almost said world work. The work world because I need some income and I don't make any money for doing these blogs. But anyhow, I don't have a vehicle. I need a vehicle. So... Tonight, I am introducing the case of Jason Dubois, which I was asked to discuss by a person close to him who feels his death was not an accident. He had been riding his four-wheeler on a train track in Springdale, Arkansas, where he also lived 
not on the train track, obviously, but in Springdale, Arkansas, um, with a friend. He was riding on the train tracks with a friend. Earlier in the evening, he had some trouble with his four-wheeler stalling, but he worked on it, and it seems the four-wheeler was working fine when he had his accident or when his death occurred. The friend was riding another of Jason's four-wheelers and said it got stuck near a bridge on the tracks. I'm like in front of the bridge on the tracks, so he worked to get it unstuck. He said Jason flew past him and he watched till he disappeared down the track. Yet it appears that bridge is where Jason was later found. This is Jason Dubois I'm talking about now. Um, I will bring up some more stuff concerning Jason Learall here in a little bit. A little bit of overlap with the two cases. Um, but So it appears the bridge was where Jason was later found underneath of the bridge. Um, but I found out not actually really underneath the bridge. I'll explain that later. Near the four-wheeler, dead, sadly. It took his friend it took his friend more than six hours to walk one half mile, mess with, try to get the four-wheeler unstuck, and stash the four-wheeler in the woods. Um, he didn't want to he didn't want someone to see the four-wheeler, didn't want to leave it sitting on the track or near the track, and didn't want someone coming along and stealing it or something along that line, of course. The fact that it took that he was gone for more than six hours doing all of this stuff alone is somewhat suspicious, though I'm sure part of that time was spent looking for Jason or waiting for him to come back to where the friend was once he realized he'd clearly passed the friend. You know, if it was me, I'm riding my four-wheeler and I fly by the person. Of course, it was dark out. He may have not realized he flew past the person. But if I was the friend, I'd be like, oh, he flew past me. He's going to go down the track three or four minutes, be like, well, I guess I must have passed him and turn around and come back. So 10 minutes tops, you know, uh, I'll wait for him and see if he comes back. And then if he doesn't, it's like, hmm, where did he go, you know? Um, and as I said... It was dark outside when all of this happened. I don't know the exact time frame that it happened, um, but I do have some rough estimates, and I'll talk about that here in a little bit. It is also said that this Jason, Jason Dubois, and his friend both either knew or knew of the woman who owns the land where Jason J. Lyrell was visiting and staying before he disappeared. So it appears they may have known other people in common or even known each other. That's why I'm discussing the two in the same vlog. That was part of their stories. The two cases may even be connected in some way since they do have friends in common. And the friend of Jason Dubois has friends in common on Facebook with Jason Lyrell. But this friend and Jason are the same age. The friends they have in common who are connected to Jason Lyrell's case are basically the same age as the two of them are. So, um, that could just be coincidence, but, you know. Um, so, yeah, Jay Lyrell is the same age or close to the same age as these other people, including Jason Dubois' friend. He was writing the four-wheeler with the night that he died. We all know how dangerous ATVs can be even if you ride them regularly. It's like most of the people who go missing in national parks are very experienced hikers but anything can happen and stuff often goes wrong. Um, and this reminds me of the story recently that occurred in the Oklahoma City area, an 18-year-old boy was walking along a creek, um, walking along on, above the bank of the creek, looking for a spot to go fishing, I like looking down at the creek, trying to find a spot that he thought would be the best spot to go fishing, when he 
stepped on some loose gravel and slipped and slid into the water. And um, I'm not sure if he called, someone called, and if they hadn't got there as soon as they did, he would have not survived that incident. But this shows how quickly um, things can go wrong and, you know, the type of things that can go wrong. Started to say I lost my place now. Um, for some reason, there is no information about Jason Dubois' death online other than his obituary and an incident report from the railroad inspector that you have to know where to look for. I couldn't even find any information on Facebook about his accident. Um, when I looked up his name, it, of course, showed me his profile. There were people who were talking about that he did pass away, but there was nothing at all. You know, people share the news stories about people passing away um, and about accidents occurring and stuff like that. And there was nothing along that line that was on there. This incident happened on December the 10th, 2021, approximately six weeks before Jason Learall went missing. The weather on December 10th, 2021 is said to have been clear and calm. Remember they were riding on the train track, which is trespassing and extremely illegal, extremely dangerous. The track conditions add to the danger. In the area they were riding and several other areas, there are steep inclines, also known as embankments, along the tracks, as well as various debris on the tracks themselves. For this reason, it is safest to drive slowly. One of Jason Dubois' biggest loves was riding his ATVs. That is in his obituary. He loved riding ATVs. He did die doing something that he enjoyed a great deal, at least. Um, According to this person close to Jason, his wife had gone to meet them at the tunnel and saw them at a gas station on her way to the tunnel. Now that would be the gas station where they were planning to fill up the four-wheelers. Um, and I'm sure, you know, she was like, oh, I thought they would be further than this. What are they still doing here? Um, I left part of the stuff out here. I didn't think I did, but... This is when um, his four-wheeler had been stalling. That's why they were still there. Uh, I don't know if they had already gotten gas and they went to take off and it was stalling or if it was stalling on the way there. And anyway, he, as I stated earlier, um, worked on it and got it to where it was running properly. And I'm guessing they got gas. I don't know for sure whether they did go ahead and get gas. They were planning to. Um, but... So yes, she saw them at the gas station on her way um, to meet them at the tunnel. Then she drove to wait for them near the tunnel. Um, like, I guess they went to the tracks or whatever. And she went to um, wait for them near where the tunnel was, but never saw them come through the tunnel. So she went home because she was tired. Now this makes it sound like she just drove down there and went home. That's not the case. Um, from what I'm told, she drove down there, hung around probably at least 30 minutes to an hour. And then, you know, she was like, well, I'm tired. I'm going to go home. She went over there so, because she wanted to see her husband and spend time with him and his friend while they were doing their four-wheeling stuff, even though she doesn't really like four-wheeling herself, it is said. Uh, oh, yes. I'm thinking from the time he was found and that his friend took more than six hours working on his four-wheeler and stuff, trying to get it unstuck and such, um, which was actually another of Jason Dubois' four-wheelers, that they must have started riding around 11 p.m. or 12 a.m. midnight probably sometime between those two times. 
I wish I could sit this phone up straighter. <laughs> anyway, I just, I'm too annoyed. Sorry, folks. Hmm, interesting. Someone who saw Jason Du Bois, um, someone who saw Jason Du Bois' friend that morning said he looked wide-eyed, nervous, and disheveled before Jason's body was found. The bridge Jason's body was found under goes over a storm drain. I myself would like to see this area. Like if I had a vehicle, I'd be driving down there like, I want to see this area. But I don't have a vehicle right now. But I would like to see this area or at least see pictures of it to get a better idea of what may have happened. But I live far away and, as I said, have no vehicle. You know. The friend said his four-wheeler had got stuck on the tracks. Jason often rode on them, but I'm not sure if his friend had rode on them before or not. He said after he got the four-wheeler unstuck, his four-wheeler ran out of gas. That's why he stashed it in the woods um, so that nobody would look behind an embankment in the woods or something along that line. So that no one would know it was there. No one would mess with it. <coughs> Hopefully anyway. Um, the two had planned to get gas at the gas station. But they may have forgot to do that. Since Jason Dubois' four-wheeler had been having problems with stalling. Um, I would think that would be more reason to get gas. But he may have been like messing with other stuff. And then you know, his wife came along and he's like, oh, we need to go. And forgot to get gas. I don't know. Or maybe there was an it just there were some issues with the four wheelers. I don't know. Um. So that was why his friend stashed the four wheeler he was riding in the woods, as I said, because he ran out of gas. Um. It was not running. He didn't want to leave it on the tracks, near the tracks, where people could see it. Then he walked to the home of some friends, which was about ten or fifteen minutes away, possibly twenty minutes away, in the dark, <laughs> not being sure where you were going, maybe. Now, I'm trying to imagine this area near the bridge where the friend got his four-wheeler stuck. Um, it was said to be in front of where the bridge was because it is said that Jason flew by him when he was stuck. And so this is what got me thinking here, and I'm like, I think I figured out exactly what did end up happening, perhaps. Um, but yeah, I would like to see the area because he said that he flew by him. Um, when he was stuck, I'm pretty sure he was stuck on the track. He would have had to be stuck on the track, right? Not next to it. You wouldn't get stuck next to it. So how exactly did Jason fly by him? It's possible he was on the embankment, but far more likely that Jason got on the embankment to go around him. Um, and this is the point where I was like, oh, gee, I think, I think I know exactly what ended up happening. The friend was stuck on the track. Um, and Jason didn't see him in time to be able to do evasive maneuvers. Um, swerved to go around him, ran off the track underneath the bridge, um, and ended up sadly dying that way. But if that is the case... I mean, I know it was dark. I don't know how dark it was. Um, it was supposed to be clear, so there should have been stars in the moon. Well, I don't know what stage the moon would have been in. But um, I would think, at the least, his friend should have been charged with leaving the scene of an accident, maybe. But possibly he didn't see that that was what happened. But he, but he is said to have told people that he that Jason flew around him, or that Jason flew by him, um, and he saw him disappear down the track. So that makes me go like, if you were on the track, and there was only one track, you would have to know that he would have had to have got onto the embankment. But anyway, um, so given where Jason was found, in my opinion, it's plausible that he did get over onto the embankment to go around his friend whose four-wheeler was stuck. 
If his friend was in fact stuck and trying to get unstuck, he may not have seen Jason's four-wheeler veer down the embankment of the track and may have thought he had gone on down the track toward the tunnel. So what I'm saying here, imagine, okay, the one four-wheeler is stuck on the track and the embankment's over here and maybe he thought there was enough room that he could swerve over go right around him and then come back onto the track and maybe that's what he thought that he did. Maybe he was bent down messing with the four-wheeler and didn't see exactly what happened. I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, or maybe he saw exactly what happened. Maybe what happened is not even what I'm thinking happened. But I'm thinking that it is. Um, so two of Jason's friends returned to the area where the friend he was riding the four-wheeler with, and he was one of the ones that returned, um, him and another friend. They returned to the area where the friend who was riding with him had last seen him and found him fairly quick, like probably within five to ten minutes they found him, maybe not even that long. My guess is they walked beside the track and next to the area under the bridge. That's what I'd do if I was looking for someone in an area like that. It seems perhaps the only thing the police found suspicious was that he was riding on the tracks. And this is from the information the person close to Jason Dubois gave me. Um, like they questioned his friends and wife and um i don't know that they questioned anyone else that was around there but the friends and the wife i don't know that anyone else was even around but they um questioned them and were like don't you find it odd that he was riding on the track and they were like no he did it all the time so all of the people who were there at the location he was found when emergency crews arrived in my opinion should have been interviewed from what I understand, only two people were interviewed, and there were at least three people there, possibly more. Um, Jason's case was initially classified as a suspicious death. We think that it is closed now. Um, I'm going to cover some more about his case next time, and I'm sorry this is running so long. I threw those other stories in there. Probably shouldn't have. But... Um, we do think that his case is closed now. I am not 100% certain that it is. I may call the Springdale Police Department and um, see if I can find out whether it is or not. I'm not sure that I will do that because my family has some stuff going on right now. Um, stuff to deal with and all that, as all families always do. So, there are there are differing accounts, and I was going to put both of those on this one, but I didn't find the other differing account in my initial notes, um, so they're way further down, so I will have to um, tell you guys the other one next time, and I'll try to remember to, do, uh, to also include this one, but there are differing accounts of how he was laying, how his body was laying when he was found. One says he was on his left side, body extended, arms straight out in front of him, and crossed at the wrist, facing the direction they had been riding from. Not the direction they were going, but the direction they were riding from. His four-wheeler was about 30 feet from the bridge on its side in fourth gear and intact. The plastics on it did not break, but the muffler had come off, which makes me speculate that the muffler most likely hit against something um, for it to be knocked off. And maybe the plastic didn't knock against anything until it hit the ground, and maybe it had slowed by then. I don't think that makes sense, though. According to my research, depending on the make and model, of course, a four-wheeler in fourth gear can go more than 70 miles per hour and could get up close to 100 miles per hour. Now, I think that is talking about ones that only have four gears, um, just to be clear. The model that he was driving most likely had five gears. The bridge is said to have been 15 
through 30 feet um, high with abutments at each end to support the bridge and possibly an abutment in the center of the bridge. Abutments are the big cement things that help to support the bridge, and it's possible there was one in the center depending on how long the bridge was. And from a picture, a hand-drawn picture that I saw, I would say there was one in the center also. And there's a storm drain running under it. I'm not sure if that's a concrete culvert or a big, one of the big square concrete um, storm drains or perhaps not even a covered storm drain. It may just be like the big cement, um, I, I don't even know what they're called, storm drains that aren't covered, that's what they're called, I guess. Um, and as I, well, I said I will give the other account of how his body was laying in a little bit, but I'm actually going to do that next Monday um, when I cover the rest of the story. So the detective for his case stated that he was going more than 30 miles per hour down the side of the track, and see that would be down the embankment, um, the side. Um, I said I'm thinking he's referring to the embankment as down the side of the track. These embankments are steep and have loose gravel on them, so it's very dangerous to ride on them, and especially going very fast, and that's when I was like, well, okay, so if that's what he said happened, then I'm thinking he did do what I was saying a, a while ago, and, like, he saw that his friend was there and didn't have time to slow down for him, so he swerved to go around him and hit that loose gravel and just, um, lost control, sadly. Most, um, oh, yes. So most likely... In fourth gear, the slowest he would have been going is around 30 miles per hour, with the fastest being very fast. Um, though, as I stated, most manual four-wheelers have five gears, so his top speed in fourth gear may have been around 50 miles per hour. <coughs> the detective... Um, speculated that he was going a max or that he was going approximately 35 so it's like he did try to slow down in my opinion or he was not going super fast odds are when Jason approached the bridge he saw his friend was stuck in front of it and moved to make an evasive maneuver in order to miss him this took him down the embankment causing his tire to hit the abutment and him and his ATV flipped from the force of it, um, from the force of the impact. The ATV may have ramped, so to speak, instead of flipping, since it weighed more than he did. Um, and it's my understanding that the ATV did not flip, that it most likely did ramp off of the thing, which would have shot it out a little further than him. And it being heavier than him, it would not have flipped. Jason traveled this bridge all the time and knew there was no room for error. Um, the person close to him made this statement, and that's part of when I went. But if his he was not used to his friend being stuck in front of the bridge and it being so dark and him being like, oh crap, you know. They were riding, from what I understand, with the headlamps off. Like the, the lights on the four-wheelers were off and, well, his anyway, and he was wearing one of the headlamp things like you use for mining and caving and stuff like that, um, which I don't think would have provided as good of light, but I could be wrong. Um, but yeah, so he knew there was no room for error. It was dark out. He may have not seen his friend was stopped in time to slow down enough to avoid a collision, and his friend may not have realized exactly what happened. As I said, he also may have realized what happened and maybe should have been charged with leaving the scene of an accident, but maybe not. Um, because I don't know exactly what happened, you know. 
the detective made it seem like Jason came up on the bridge and didn't know the bridge was there because he was riding in the dark. Um, I'm not sure that the detective knew that the friend was stuck on another four-wheeler, seeing as he had stashed the other four-wheeler in the woods, um, but I'm sure that someone mentioned that the, there was another four-wheeler that had been there. Um, Jason Dubois wasn't actually found directly under the bridge, but was laying on the ground just off to the side of the bridge where the concrete storm drain ends and the rainwater runoff makes a creek. So that's what I was saying earlier. Um, I said something about that he was found under, under the bridge and like underneath the bridge he wasn't he was found, I mean, he was, but not, like, directly underneath the bridge. He was found over to the side, and I was wondering, because of the storm drain thing, you know, and it going over the storm drain. His ATV was farther out than his body. Um, his case is definitely very interesting, but I am going to have to pick it up next week, as I said. Um, next Monday, along with discussing at least part of Armin B. Johnson's case, because I don't want these vlogs to run too long, and they almost always end up being 45 minutes to an hour anyway. So make sure that you watch next week's vlog, and I will finish discussing the case of Jason Dubois. Um, there were a couple of other cases that I have discussed in the past that I was wanting to look into, the last I checked, there were no updates on the Kylan Schulte and Crystal Turner case, but it's been at least four or five days since I checked, and um, I wanted to check and see if there were any charges ever brought in Josue Calderon's case, but I haven't done that yet. Um, as I said, I wish that I could, I wish I could update on all of these cases every week and discuss all of the different ones, like, regularly, but... For right now, I am going to sign off, um, partly so I can work on the, well, I'm going to do the description, I guess, probably tomorrow night, um, and put the phone numbers in there and stuff, um, but yeah, next Monday, I will be discussing Jason Dubois' case again, if there are any updates on Jason Lerl's case, I will discuss that, um, if there is anything new on Kylan and Kylan Schulte and Crystal Turner. I will discuss that. I will try to look into Josue Calderon's case, and I will be discussing the case of Armand B. Johnson, um, who died in, at Hawaii Volcanoes National Park in 2005. So until next time, everyone have a great whatever time of night or day it is in your part of the world. Stay safe and stay positive especially stay safe. There's a lot going on.